you know, even after <clears throat> over 40 years of experience in Adventist ministry and church administration, I still get uncomfortable when everybody leaves. <laughs> yes. um, anyway, it's good to be here. I, uh, I've heard so many good things about this church. I, uh, I'm friends with Jeff Patterson. We don't happen to be related. We don't think. Um, interesting that over the years we've discovered that his family and my family came from the same county in Iowa. And our great great no our great grandparents, both his and mine, emigrated to Alberta, Canada about the same time. And I think that he is reluctant to do any further research. <laughs> they might find out who stole the horses. You know, so anyway, I have, uh, have deep respect for, for Jeff and his dad and mom, and, and I've known them all for a long time, and, uh, and I would be honored to be re related to them. You know, it was always curious to me, when he would come to Andrews during the time he was working on his doctorate, I would invite him to stay at our house. It's just three minutes from, from the seminary, and uh, he would always turn me down. And he would say, I'm going to Pawpaw. Now, I've heard about Pawpaw all my life. Maybe one of the great mysteries of my life is knowing what a Pawpaw is. You know, now don't tell me. It might spoil the mystery. But, uh, you know, I've, 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 I grew up in, in uh, rural Missouri. But I've lived almost all sides of the United States. I've eaten food from every continent in the world, and I've never seen a pawpaw. <laughs> so I don't know if they exist or not, but I know this place exists, and, uh, and for that I give God thanks. Uh, and I, I uh, also want to extend a, a note of appreciation to, to Mona, uh, who was willing to take the risk of having me come down and talk to you. So. Anyway, good to be here. God bless each one of you. Um, I'm skipping over part of the, the slides in, in this file because I want to spend the time on a story. Um, it's a story that requires us to take a look at our understanding of who Saul was. Um, I'm going to ask your indulgence because I'm going to be a little bit critical of Saul this morning. Not because uh, I, I have a purpose or reason for disparaging him, but I think there's something that we can learn by looking at a larger picture that this story takes place in. Um, I shared, I shared uh, this this uh, presentation with a group at a camp meeting out west just a couple of years ago. Uh, it was an ethnic camp meeting, and they had one man that was kind of the elder over the whole state of California. It was, you know, in this ethnic group. And so I did my thing on Sabbath, and I presented this, and on Sunday morning, the elder rebuked me publicly from the pulpit. It caused me to have to sit there and be humble and accept that, that, that rebuke. He rebuked me in the name of the Lord for, for speaking against God's anointed. So I'm just warning you. I didn't think I was that harsh. <laughs> no. But uh, um, if you think I'm too hard on Saul, blame it on Mona. For not vetting the speakers well enough, okay? <laughs> um, so here we go. Here we go. Let me just give you background. <clears throat> I, re I got my first Social Security check last month. So, so I have a sympathy for old Samuel... When the elders came to him and says, you are getting old. You think, I don't know that? 
You know, <laughs> go up and down stairs. I'm telling you, I'm getting old. So they confront him with his age. They challenge him regarding the faithfulness of his two sons. Guilty on both counts, age and children. I'm not going to tell you about my children. I have good children, though, sometimes. And so they say to, they say to Samuel, give us a king like the other nations. Now my question is, did God ever intend that we have a political ruler that stands between us and him? Not in his plan. It was not in his plan. This is not the first time they asked. They approached, they approached Gideon after his battle with the Midianites. I got the right people there, Midianites, right? And they said, be our king. And your sons after you and your sons' sons after them. So they're asking for a dynasty. What did, he, what did Gideon say? How did he respond? It's a very simple two-letter answer. No. No. And then maybe the most important three words, maybe the most important three words that Gideon ever uttered. No. That doesn't count. That's not one of the three. No. God is your ruler. That's four. I'm sorry, four. God is your ruler. You don't need me to be a king. You have a king forever. You have a king. No. And so Israel moves on without a king. And so they come to Samuel and say, you're getting old. Your sons are, are unfaithful. They lack the ability to spiritually lead. We want a king. And, and let me just give you a little bit of the nuance of their request. Very politically correct request. If you read in, in, in 1 Samuel 8, they use a Hebrew word, and I'm not a Hebrew scholar, okay, so I'm getting this secondhand. They use a Hebrew word that means a king who is a judge. It's a very specific kind of king. Now, this is politically correct because they're living in the period of what? In the period of the judges. So they're softening their request. They thought about this, they built a little strategy, used the right linguistics, and they present their request. Give us a king. But give us a king who is a judge. Now, Samuel knew exactly what they were asking for, or he thought he did. So he goes to God and he presents to God the request of the elders. But when he presents it to God, he interprets the king word and uses a different word. Here's what he says. They ask for a king who will rule over them. Totally different word. God listens to him, and then God goes into a long, detailed warning why this should not happen. He tells them what's going to happen. He, said, he, he ends his warning with this, with this statement. They will regret the day that they requested this. But sometimes God gives us what we ask for, even when he knows that we shouldn't have it. So God answers the request, and he reinterprets the word king. It's fascinating, because three different words that are used. King who is judged, that's a request. Samuel passes on the request to God, a king who is a ruler. God responds by saying, give them a commander. Now, those are different kinds of leaders. Give them a commander. So, they did not ask for a commander, 
But I'm guessing in the in in the in the in the omnipotence in I mean excuse me omniscience of God, he understood what they really want. They want someone to go fight their battles for them. I was sitting in the pastor's office about five minutes till eleven, and I looked up on the wall and I read your mission statement. I hope you know your mission statement. It's a good one. It's a good one. The mission statement of the Paw Paw Church embraces the idea that ministry is not belong to the pastor. Ministry belongs to the church. Disciples who make disciples. I congratulate you on that mission, or on that, I mean, on that, uh, on that mission statement. So God says, give them a commander. Now that sets the stage. Saul doesn't have a clue about any of this. His primary, his primary qualification is that he's tall. Have you ever noticed short, fat people are not as attractive as leaders as tall people? Makes me wonder, why in the world Trump fired Comey? You got this tall leader, fairly good looking, you know. Anyway, let's not go down that path. <laughs> so, back out on the farm. Jesse, no, 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 not Jesse. The father of Saul, Kish was his name. Kish can't find the donkeys. And so he calls his son, Saul, and he says, I want you to take one of the servants. He is not specific. Take one of the servants and go find the donkeys, for they are lost. Now let me just give you a suggestion or a thought. The donkeys knew exactly where they were. The donkeys were not lost. They simply went where they wanted to go, okay? And so it was a matter of Kish and his family to find out where the donkeys had gone, bring them back where they wanted them to be, the control relationship between stock and farmer, okay? So here, let's, uh, let's pick up on this and uh, <clears throat> actually read the, read the story from Scripture. Now, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost, I already told you, they're not, they don't know that. But. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you. Arise, go, and look for the donkeys. So he passed through, now it's skipping over a lot here. It doesn't talk about how he, he, chose, uh, how he chose the servant. My guess is that, Paul, or that Saul probably had a relational connection or something that would cause him to choose a particular servant. I don't know. And it may simply have been a matter of God's ordaining and God's leading. But follow with me. So he passed through the mountains of Ephraim. What tribe is Kish a part of? Now that should be right on the tip of your tongue. What tribe was Saul from? Benjamin, thank you. So keep that in mind. Now he's out of Benjamin. He's up in Ephraim and through the land of Shalisha, but they didn't find them. And then they passed through the land of Sha'alim, and they were not there. Then they passed through the land of the Benjamites. What does that tell you about where they are? This is not school. This is church. You can talk. Where are they? They're home. Keep that in mind. Keep it in mind. And so they passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they did not find them. Now, when they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, come on, let's, let's go home. Now, I'm translating it. Come, let's go home. It's possible that, that dad is going to quit worrying about the donkeys and be worried about us, so let's go home. 
Is that a legitimate concern? Well, I'm not ready to judge him as inappropriate at this point, but I'm going to get there. Okay. So he said, why don't you go home? Let's, let's, not, let's not worry, Dad. And verse 6, and he said to him, now this is the servant talking now. What are some servants supposed to do? Obey. Right? And, and understand, servant is a nice word for slave. Servant is a nice word for slave. And so here's the servant talking, and he, he's either leveraging a, an existing relationship with Saul, or he's taking a risk. He says, look now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. So let's go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. What does this say about the servant? Does he know Samuel? The servant is aware of who Samuel is. He knows where he's staying. And he takes a risk. He also has confidence in him. And then Saul said to his servant, but look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? What's the assumption here? What is the assumption? The assumption is that Samuel charges for his service. Okay? So he's thinking transactionally. He has, he has evidently embraced a business model that says, if a person is there and they do that, they're not going to do it for nothing. They have to live. And we don't have anything to give him. Now listen. Oh, that's not the end of it. What shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone. Now I'm going to tell you, that's where my antennas start to go up. I mean, I raised four kids. And you have to interpret their behavior, and you have to interpret their excuses. You follow me? That's where wisdom is needed in parenting. Uh, my dad usually solved it by, by saying, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to punish all of you. I don't think I ever heard him use the word punish. It was more specific. Okay. <laughs> so we'd land all, or line all six of us up, you know, and we'd take our turns, you know. Anyway, he says, there is no present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? Now, I don't know if Saul reached into his pocket and felt for change. It's kind of like my friend coming up here and, and hitting me up a second time. Okay. <laughs> By God's grace, I had one dollar bill left. All right. Saul says, I don't have anything. What is a leader supposed to have? If you're the leader, you're supposed to have access to resources. It's what we bring to the table. It's what we ought to be bringing to the table. Saul says, I don't have anything. So the servant reaches into his pocket and he pulls out what? Look at your word. Uh, verse 8, look, I have here at hand a quarter shekel of silver. I'll give that to the man of God to tell us our way. I, I want you to stop for just a second. Do you have any suspicion about Saul's reason for going home? Hungry. Are you following me? He's been all day long. All their food is gone. That's already been given to us in the Word. Food is gone. The servant wants to go down to this village. They don't have 
enough money to buy food. Evidently, Saul didn't bring in. He's like my youngest brother. We used, to, we used to tell him he had arms like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Because you'd go to a restaurant, you know, he'd go like, he could never reach his pocket. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing, telling me, you know, you know people like that. <laughs> well, that. You're not taping this, are you? Okay, yes, you are. <laughs> okay. But, but he has gotten over it. Okay. All right. But Saul doesn't want to go on. He doesn't want to go on. Going home may be, and I'm saying may, may be more important than pursuing the mission. Taking care of self may outrank the purpose for that mission. The mission was find the donkeys. They had made a circle and ended back up in Benjamin. Food is gone. Saul says, let's go home. Servant says, no, let's go down here and find the man of God. Saul says, we don't have anything to give. The servant says, oh, yeah, we do. He said, I got a quarter shekel of silver. I don't know how far that would go. I have no idea. But who's providing the resources? The servant. Who is setting the agenda for leadership? The servant. This is all kind of turned around, isn't it? Let me just make an application at this point. If we forget what the mission of the church is about, and we become more interested in taking care of self than pursuing the mission. We need to find our way to the closet, close the door, and pray until we are blessed with a passion for the ministry that God has given us. We need to know who. We need to know who is leading us. And in this day and age, who's our leader? The same as it was for Gideon. God is our leader. Don't make the mistake of thinking that your ordained pastor or, or some other ordained minister is your primary leader. That is not the case. They serve as agents of the Holy Spirit. They serve as agents of God. But our leader remains God. Amen. We don't have to ask permission to talk to him. And he will provide for us in terms of the resources needed for our mission. I mean, it's amazing what Jesus says. He says, all, the, all of the authority, all the power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And if you'll allow me to use a little imagery, instead of being an iPad, air iPad, he holds out a golden platter, and on this platter is heaped all the authority in heaven and earth. He says, take what you need, but go. And if you run out, come back. Because I have all the power in heaven and earth. You will never run out. Our leader has resources. And he makes those resources available to us. But we have to know him first. Keep that in mind if you would. So the narrative continues. They go to the city, and I, I skipped over a part. Let me, let me add this. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed in reading through the Old Testament how often that the journey ends at the well? And what is always at the well? Now kind of let your, let your inhibitions down for just a moment. What do you always find at the well? Girls. <laughs> now, I'm, not, I'm not stretching this. This is the truth. I mean, if, if you're an unmarried man in the Old Testament period, go to the well. <laughs> Moses takes off from Egypt. He ends up at the well in Midian 
in, 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 uh, and he met his future wife right there, right off, right off the bat. You know, where did, where did Eliezer find out about Sarah? Not Sarah. Um, help me. Rebecca. Where, where, did he, where, where did he go? To the well. Keep that in mind. Unless you're married. Okay, but this is a good strategy, all right? So they stop at the well, and sure enough, here are, these, here are, here are the girls that the, are at the well. And Saul asked, where is the seer? That was the word used, where is the seer? And they said, oh, he's just now coming out of the gate of the city. And so they head on down to the gate, and so this is where we're at now. They're at the gate, Samuel is coming out of the gate, and I want you to notice something. So Saul asks where Samuel the prophet is to be found, and Samuel introduces himself. So in other words, the man coming out of the gate is Samuel. And Saul says to Samuel, or to Samuel, where is the seer? What does that tell you about Saul? He does not have a clue who Samuel is. Now, does that strike you as odd? Strikes me as odd. I hope you're not reading me as extremely cynical. But I'm being a little bit cynical right now about Saul. I've had the privilege of vetting for 15, 16 years of my, of my ministry, I was responsible for vetting and processing and making recommendations for pastors, uh, for churches. Actually, I made the recommendation to, to my colleagues on AdCom, but choosing the right leader is a critically important part or function of the church. It's a critical function. And I can tell you, folks, if, if I ran into a pastor that could not articulate an understanding of who his leader is, and I'm not talking about earthly leader, or who the agent was, the key agent of God on earth, I would have to look a little longer before I would choose a pastor and, and recommend him to a church that did not know Samuel. Are you following me? So what are the implications? God has already appointed that Saul will be the first king of Israel. Why would God choose a man who was clueless about the spiritual resources necessary to lead. And this, this builds my suspicion, folks. It builds my suspicion. You know, a few quarters back, we studied uh, um, Jeremiah, remember? And the importance of a spiritual king Remember when we got to the, is it Josiah was the good king right towards the end? You get down to Josiah, and Josiah is a good king. But the people have become so immune to the Spirit of God that God says, it doesn't matter how good he is. I'm sending you into captivity. And he referred to, later on, he referred to Nebuchadnezzar as what? My my servant. Is it possible that Saul, that Saul was selected to help Israel find out where they were wrongly pointing themselves in terms of wanting a human leader? Do you realize this happened in the Adventist church about 1905? God's people approached the general conference 
approached Ellen White, said, give us a pastor like all the other churches. Do you realize up until 1920, pastors were not assigned to local churches? Pastors were assigned to projects. Pastors in those days never attended church board meetings. The church owned the process of caring for their church. Now that's gone. That's gone. If you read Ellen White's writings in this context, you'll find out that Ellen White did not encourage the idea of fixed districts for pastors because she knew that the tendency is to model behavior on the basis of the leader. It can be good or it can be not so good. But we see this pattern throughout the years of the kings of Israel. Good king, good Israel. Bad king, bad Israel. So you have this cycle that carries through. So Saul is standing there looking at at Samuel and he doesn't know him. That scares me for Israel's sake. That frightens me. But the servant knew him. The servant knew him. Let me move on. So Samuel answered Saul and said, I'm the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. Now, this reveals to us that Samuel was already aware that Saul would come to him. This is not news to Samuel. He has prepared a banquet. He's even identified the piece of food. I'm not going to say meat, just the piece of food that he's supposed to eat and what part of the beast it's taken from. Okay? So you're going to eat with me, and tomorrow I'll let you go and we'll tell you all that is in your heart. Oh, and by the way, verse 20, as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found. They've been found. And on whom, dry preacher, yes, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? So Samuel is revealing to Saul that all of Israel has their eye on him. And Saul does not have a clue. He is absolutely clueless. Let's see here. So then Saul and his servant, or Samuel took Saul and his servant, brought them into the hall. I want you to notice who went into the hall with Saul. Who is mentioned as accompanying him into the banquet hall? The servant. Is that normal? Is that normal? That is not normal. Normally the servant would sit out under a tree or there would be another building. The servant would not go into the banquet hall. But in this case, the servant is invited in and sits with Saul. Why? Have any of you named any of your children or grandchildren after this servant? Nameless. I, I, had, a, I had something happen to me recently. My granddaughter, who, who gave us our grandson, our great grandson, came and visited us two or three days. And this little kid, the moment that I saw him, he looked like a bruiser. And so I started calling him bruiser. Several months later, somebody asked me, well, what is your great-grandson's name? I said, I don't have a clue. I don't know his name. All I've ever called him is bruiser. And I, I didn't have the heart to call my daughter and say, what is, what is his name? <laughs> so I called my youngest daughter. I said, what is what is?" Lana's baby's name. And she said his name's Harrison. That's a beautiful name. 
But he's still bruiser to me. I don't know, you know. <laughs> anyway, I don't even know why I told you that. Um, so they, they let the servant come in and sit with, sit with Saul. I think it is because that was God's way of saying to the servant, thank you. And honoring the servant who actually led a king to the announcement of his coronation. This whole story is, is an odd story because here is a subordinate who is leading his leader. Let me suggest to you it happens more often than you might think. But it also challenges our attitudes of hierarchy. That if we sit around and wait, we need to stop and stay connected with God and know that there are moments in life when you say, I'm just a deacon, there's no such thing as just a deacon. I'm just an elder. There's no such thing as just an elder. You are an elder. And you have authority. You have been given responsibility. Now, you balance that with good communication, what have you. But I believe this servant tells me that we need to be respectfully proactive in directing even those above us. Now, you hear the word respectfully. That's an essential but, you know, you, you look at the story of creation. This is before sin ever comes about. And I'm not, I don't have time to, to, to go into detail on this. But the first evidence of leadership in the Bible is that leadership is a conversation. The Godhead, I mean, it was, you know, I, I taught my children. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And in their little, their little childish minds, they see one person, God. But that word actually is plural, the Godhead. When you think about it, one of the voices, and we don't even know who, this is a nameless person, part of the Godhead. Somebody says, let's make him in our image. You realize it doesn't tell us who that is, who said it? Maybe the most important decision in all of creation is made by a person, we don't know who it is. Let us make man in our image. Let us is part of a conversation. Leadership in the beginning was conversation. And I believe that we need to be as a people constantly in conversation about the mission and the effectiveness and the accountability of the church. Not in a judgmental fashion, but in a constructive, proactive, creative approach to building God's kingdom. Does that make any sense to you? And so Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took the thigh with his upper part and set it before Saul, and Samuel said, here it is, what was kept back. It was set apart for you, eat, for until this time it has been kept for you. Now I don't know what the wheels in Saul's mind were doing. But if he was any kind of a mathematician at all, he would figure out that this was all happening before he even knew that he was supposed to go look for the donkeys. This is foreordained. Now, one of the things we often forget is that Saul went through a revival experience after this. It didn't last, but he went through a revival experience So it says, Saul ate with Samuel that day. And as they were going, now this is the next day now, as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go ahead of us. And he went on. The end of the servant. We never hear from him again. Here's the person that led the first king of Israel to his the announcement of his coronation. And at the end, he rides off into obscurity, never to be heard of again. You know, if his daddy wanted him to go make a name for himself, it didn't happen as far as what's recorded in the Word of God. But I want to tell you something God noticed. God noticed because he was the leader in that journey. 
He led Saul to Samuel. But you stand here a while that I may announce to you the word of God. Now that's always a serious thing. I had a, I had a run in with a, an associate pastor who, I hate to go back to, to, to Trump again. But, you know, Trump used this word. He, he was crazy at a nut, nut job. This happened to me with an associate pastor who came and stood in front of my desk one day and said, I stand here in the name of the living God. Now, he didn't have to go anywhere beyond that statement, and I knew that this was not going to be a good conversation. <laughs> and he had in his hand a list of about 30 things that disqualified me from ministry. It was the beginning of a very painful process. Um... But that's a different story for another day. So it says that Samuel took a flask of oil and he poured it on his head. And he kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you? What's the word? Commander. Has anointed you commander over his inheritance. Now there's more to this story than I've shared with you. But I've shared enough, I've shared enough, first of all, to know that God does not always give or he does not always answer our prayers according to his will. Sometimes he answers our prayers if in our insistence we ask for, we demand something that we should not have. Sometimes the only, the only approach that God has is to give us what we ask for so that we can learn that we shouldn't have it. Does that make sense? The other thing is never think of yourself as ineffective. Make sure that in your pocket you have the spiritual resources Avail yourself of the authority and the power that God has offered to each one of us. That's not just words. That's real. And exercise proactive behavior in terms of encouraging the mission of the church. Pray about it. If you don't have a burden, you know, some of us have been so long depending on someone else doing the thinking for us that we, we no longer even think about it. But find your way to your closet. Get on your knees and say, Lord, what do you need to place in my heart that will give me a passion for souls, that will give me a passion for growing the kingdom of God on this earth? And stop worrying about position. I would suggest to you that most of the leadership in the church happens outside of position. Because if a leader that's chosen for position has not demonstrated leadership without position, you have no business making him a leader. This faithful, simple, nameless servant, I believe, would have made a better king than Saul. I'm done. God bless each one of you. And remember, you are and have the option to be as effective as that nameless servant.